The Director Series is made possible in large part by our generous supporters on Patreon. Please visit us at patreon.com backslash director series to see how your contribution enables the continued production of video essays and text articles on your favorite contemporary and classic film directors. Thank you. The success of Heart 8 had enabled its young director, Paul Thomas Anderson, with access to development executives at New Line Cinema, who wanted to help him make his follow-up. With these powerful forces at his side, Anderson looked to his 1988 short, The Dirk Diggler Story, for inspiration in creating the backbone of a new feature. He fleshed this little nugget of an idea out into Boogie Nights, a sprawling meditation on the San Fernando Valley's pornography industry over two decades of success and upheaval. So what I'm trying to tell you, Eddie, is that it takes a lot of a good old American green stuff to make one of these things, you know what I mean? Boogie Nights begins amidst the glittering disco lights of 1977, before the specter of AIDS took away the notion of free love without consequences and spurred heavy government regulation on the porn industry. Despite dealing with such lurid subject matter, Anderson manages to find a peculiar kind of dignity and grace within his characters. He shows us that pornographers are people too, just as capable of real love as we are. Before Boogie Nights, Mark Wahlberg was simply known as Marky Mark, a young rapper with a few unimpressive film credits to his name. But the role of Eddie Adams, stage name Dirk Diggler, established Wahlberg as a genuine acting force that persists to this day. Burt Reynolds is inspired casting as Jack Horner, a director of exotic pictures and the patriarch of his own little porno family empire. Like John Travolta in Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction, Reynolds' against type performance resulted in some newfound cultural relevancy after a long spell of waning popularity, eventually culminating in an Oscar nomination for his performance. Ironically, Reynolds reportedly hated the character and didn't get along with Anderson during filming. He even went so far as to fire his agent for recommending the role to him. I wanted you to come in and give me a minute so I could tell you how much I love you. I mean, it's going to be a new year and we're going to start things and, and do things. And, and I just wanted you to know how much I care about you. I really care about you, honey. You're my little baby. Julianne Moore counters the two-fisted machismo of Wahlberg and Reynolds as Amber Waves, Horner's wife and a mother figure to Dirk. She's heartbroken over her real son being taken away from her by child services. So she turns to Dirk for a surrogate relationship one that becomes incestuously sexual. Moore turns in one of her most poignant performances here as a conflicted, inherently sad woman with deep reservoirs of unconditional love, walking away with an Oscar nomination of her own for her efforts. Boogie Nights also establishes Anderson's close-knit repertory of performers, actors who have come to regularly appear in his films throughout his career. These include Luis Guzman as a nightclub owner and porn star wannabe, John C. Riley as Dirk's doggishly loyal friend and co-performer Reed Rothschild, William H. Macy as the disgruntled, cuckolded assistant director, Ricky Jay as the droll cinematographer, and Philip Baker Hall as Floyd Gondoli, a smug rival of Horner's and the personification of the encroaching malevolence of videotape. On the female side, there's Melora Walters as a sweet and naive porn actress, and Heather Graham as the plucky, somewhat ditzy roller girl. Further rounding out the cast is Don Cheadle as urban cowboy Buck Swope, Thomas Jane as cocky bad boy Todd Parker, and Bob Ridgely, who starred as Jack Horner in the Dirk Diggler story and makes his last film appearance before his untimely death here as the Colonel, an eccentric dandy and a financier of Jack's films. And last but not least, there's the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, Anderson's closest acting collaborator. Hoffman leaves behind an enduring legacy of masterful performances, one of which is found in Boogie Nights' Scotty J, a sexually confused and awkward boom operator who carries an unrequited torch for Dirk. Boogie Nights is the work of a young, ambitious filmmaker with bottomless reserves of zeal and talent. The tone is a distinctive blend of the multiple perspective affectations of Robert Altman and the volatile kinetic energy of Martin Scorsese and Jonathan Demme. Hard Eight cinematographer Robert Ellswit returns to shoot the film in the true anamorphic aspect ratio of 235 to 1, Achieved this time via actual anamorphic lenses, and not a workaround like Anderson and Ellswood had done for Hard Eight. Bob Zambecki's authentic period production design never reads as over-the-top and kitschy, instead popping from the frame in appropriate blasts of psychedelic color. 
The brilliant performances and Anderson's bold narrative are aided by a constantly moving camera that glides through the various scenes like an unstoppable roller coaster. Even from an early age, Anderson has utilized the camera more confidently and audaciously than any of his peers, effortlessly mixing Steadicam, Dolly, and handheld shots into a coherent whole. Anderson's use of the Steadicam in particular is worth noting, choosing to cover many of the scenes in long traveling shots. The most notable of this is Boogie Nights' opening shot. We start on a neon marquee flashing the film's title, and then crane down to reveal a lively street scene that establishes both the setting and the time period. Then, without skipping a beat, the camera operator steps off his platform on the crane, and then enters Guzman's nightclub as Anderson introduces us to all the major players of the story in one unbroken take, a la Altman's iconic opening to the player. Of course, all this virtuoso camera work wouldn't be nearly as effective without editor Dylan Tichenor to stitch it all together. The film runs nearly three hours long, but it feels half that length thanks to Tichenor's breathless pacing and exuberant sense of energy. A major commercial selling point of Boogie Nights was the music, specifically the glut of 1970s and 80s pop hits that likely moved more copies of the soundtrack CD than the actual film itself. Anderson's ear for music is spot on, using several well-known cues in interesting ways that sell the authenticity of the era. The characteristic indulgence of the era is reflected in the glitzy needle drops, oftentimes creating an association between song and picture that becomes forever joined in the mind. One instance of this is a scene where Alfred Molina's drug dealer character sings along to Rick Springfield's Jesse's Girl during a particularly foreboding business exchange. It's an unbearably tense sequence and a masterclass in direction even without the music, but its inclusion transforms the scene into a truly transcendent moment. For the score, Anderson recruits Hard Eight's Michael Penn, who bases his musical palette around an inspired conceit, a circus. The film opens against black with a somber dirge that sounds like a sad clown flailing around under the big top. A theme that reprises itself later on as a motif signifying Jack Horner's little family unit. The strange, carnival-esque nature of Penn's score reflects Anderson's bizarre, yet touching display of humanity, while highlighting the hidden similarities between two decidedly different, performance-based occupations. Several of Anderson's thematic preoccupations are present here coalescing into an identifiable set of tropes. As a member of the first generation to come up under the rise of video, Anderson's incorporation of the medium is more involved than any other filmmaker of his ilk. In Boogie Nights, the arrival of the video format itself becomes a major plot point, throwing the porn industry into a state of massive flux, and becoming a fulcrum for conflict between Reynolds and Hall's characters. Videotape highlights these two characters as ideological opposites, fighting a war that pits economics versus artistry, a conflict that can be argued to encapsulate the film industry as a whole. To the characters of Boogie Nights, video is a harbinger of doom and betrayal. Its arrival coincides with the fall of Dirk Diggler and Jack Horner, the fallout on their professional and personal lives being akin to a devastating meteor, or a nuclear bomb. Boogie Nights shows remarkable prescience in its insights into video's role in the motion picture medium. We're still having the film versus video argument today, although now the two mediums are virtually indistinguishable from each other. Because Anderson's films very rarely have life or death stakes, the driving force and the emotional drama stems from the theme of family, specifically the threat of abandonment or loss. Boogie Nights places this dynamic at the core of its story, presenting Horner's filmmaking crew as a legitimate family, sharing in each other's little life moments and cheering them on at weddings and award shows. Anderson also shows us how Dirk Diggler's abandonment of his adopted family leads to ruin. At the end of the day, he saves himself by crawling back in shame to Horner's patriarch figure. Jack? In ending his story in this fashion, Anderson has created a prodigal son fable for the 20th century. It's a parable that illustrates the conceit that tragedy will ultimately befall those who choose to permanently turn away from family. Anderson's films often set their stories in his home state of California, and Boogie Nights, perhaps more so than his other works, could not have taken place anywhere else but the Golden State. The San Fernando Valley, just north of Los Angeles, has served as the epicenter of the porn industry since its inception. Just like porn plays the red-headed, swept-under-the-rug stepchild to the Hollywood film industry, so too does the valley sit offset from Los Angeles, stigmatized and dismissed because of its sleepy, suburban airs. Like it or not, the porn industry is very much a part of Southern California's cultural heritage, 
So who better to paint its portrait than Anderson, the great cinematic chronicler of California himself? Boogie Hello. Nights is also perhaps the most frank look at another of Anderson's key recurring themes, that of sexual dysfunction. Heart Eight and Boogie Nights both flirt with sex as a paid profession, with the former's emotional tension stemming from the troubles of Gwyneth Paltrow's weary hooker Clementine, contrasting with the latter celebration of sex on camera as an act of liberation and expression. This also highlights a strange double standard when it comes to paid sex. The presence of the camera, for whatever reason, is the final arbiter between what is legal and what is not. The characters of Boogie Nights come to depend on their sexuality, as if it were a drug. Towards the end of the film, Dirk Diggler is back to where he started, reduced to jerking himself off in front of strangers for a couple bucks. For others, like Cheadles' Buck Swope, their past as porn stars hangs like a noose around their necks, impeding their progress in real-world pursuits like starting a family or taking out a business loan. We can't help you. Boogie Nights caused quite a stir when it was released, with high praise from prestigious film festivals like Toronto and New York, leading to three Oscar nominations, one of which being a screenplay nod for Anderson himself. The film was a breakout hit, its success arguably fueled by a bout of 70s nostalgia that was pervading pop culture at the time. Thankfully, Boogie Nights' legacy has outshined the trends of its day, enduring to become one of the best films of its decade, and ensuring Anderson's future as a major new talent on the scene. During the period between the release of Boogie Nights and his sprawling follow-up, Magnolia, Anderson branched out into other forms of cinematic expression. He did what many filmmakers do between features to pay the bills, shoot commercials and music videos. However, unlike other directors, it can be argued that he wasn't exactly doing for hire work. Almost all of his short form work, even to this day, can be tracked as some kind of investment in his feature work or his personal life. For instance, his first music video was made for Boogie Nights composer Michael Penn to promote his single, Try. The video was shot almost entirely in secret, with Anderson, Penn, and co-producer Joanne Seller stealing away during Boogie Nights' post-production for a couple hours. They shot in what is allegedly the longest hallway in America, located somewhere in downtown Los Angeles. The video follows Penn in one long Steadicam take as he sings to camera and marches through various vignettes. The piece is indicative of Anderson's mastery of the camera and sense of movement, as well as his confidence with a Steadicam rig. Complex moves are pulled off with a dance-like grace that makes the entire piece look effortless. Anderson is known to be somewhat of a mischievous director, and Try follows suit with a cameo by Philip Seymour Hoffman as a slobby sound recordist. The success of Boogie Nights led Anderson into an echelon of celebrity that he scarcely could have envisioned himself in only a few years prior. He started dating singer-songwriter Fiona Apple, a relationship that birthed a small run of enchanting music videos. The first of these was for Apple's cover of The Beatles Across the Universe, a track commissioned for director Gary Ross's film Pleasantville. Anderson adopted Pleasantville's black-and-white mid-century aesthetic for his video, but as a twist all his own. Conceived as a series of long takes, Apple sings to camera while hooligans and letterman jackets trash a diner in slow motion behind her. Across the Universe is a deceptively simple piece, with expertly executed camera movements that give no trace of the complicated rigging and blocking required to achieve such shots. For instance, in the opening shot we track in directly on Apple, but we don't see the camera in the mirror behind her, when common logic dictates we should. The piece is filled with little how they do that flourishes like this, and like Michael Penn's try before it, includes a cameo from one of Anderson's repertory performers in the form of John C. Riley as a suit stealing music from the jukebox. In 1999, Anderson made his second music video for Apple, for her song Fast As You Can. It's a much simpler piece, with Fiona performing straight to camera, locked into very precise compositions. While the video is straightforward and uncomplicated, Anderson does add various visual obstructions to the frame, like smudges and smears on the lens in a bid to make things a little more interesting. Anderson's third video for Apple covered her song Limp, and takes place in a dark mansion as a lovesick Apple roams the house, unable to sleep. The piece is full of the graceful, fluid camera work that Anderson is known for, but he counters the elegance by chopping it up into a series of staccato, rapid-fire edits as the song's intensity builds. The runaway success of Boogie Nights resulted in New Line Cinema gifting Anderson the opportunity to do anything he wanted as his next project. Knowing he'd never again be in this enviable position, Anderson decided to go for broke and make a passion project that he described as the all-time great San Fernando Valley film. In plotting out his story, Anderson tapped into great reservoirs of creativity and inspiration. 
What started as a small, offbeat character piece soon blossomed into an all-encompassing statement on loneliness, regret, and chance in a small patch of suburb just north of bustling Los Angeles. Magnolia sees Anderson step ever more firmly into Robert Altman territory by weaving together several disparate threads and slowly pulling them taut to reveal a tightly woven tapestry of life, love, and loss. Simply put, it's the magnum opus of Anderson's early career, capping off a long fascination with sprawling ensemble-based stories. Can I tell you something? Yeah, of course. I'm really nervous that you're going to hate me soon. You're going to find stuff out about me and you're going to hate me. The central conceit of Magnolia is that the film's story unfolds along a stretch of the eponymous street, located in the San Fernando Valley, purportedly all within a span of a few square miles. The idea is to communicate the range of humanity that can occur in such a small amount of space, and how we're more connected than we think. As the film unspools, several story threads draw closer together, the major events rippling like waves through the narrative. Magnolia explores ideas about chance and coincidence, comparing them against the larger, predetermined arc of the universe. In a move that's both inspired and utterly baffling, Anderson uses a counterintuitive image to state his case, a random, inexplicable downpour of frogs, materializing as if from nowhere and hurtling towards the earth with biblical fury. The film goes to great pains to suggest that these seemingly random events might just be the opposite, and that our fates may indeed be as preordained and unforeseeable as a sudden hailstorm of amphibians. While an expanded budget allows for higher profile actors, Anderson mostly calls his cast from his pool of Boogie Nights alumni, Riley, Walters, Hall, Macy, Hoffman, and more all deliver some of their best work here, thanks to an unwavering dedication to Anderson's vision and an eagerness to play against type. Magnolia is perhaps the most definitive example of Anderson's company of actors, featuring supporting performances from Luis Guzman as an irritable and impatient contestant on Jimmy Gator's game show, Ricky Jay as the show's producer and omniscient narrator during the film's prologue and epilogue, Alfred Molina as a Persian furniture store owner, and even Thomas Jane as a young Jimmy Gator. Of the new talent, Jason Robards gives a heartbreaking performance in his final film role as a man besieged by regret at the end of his life. Hollywood superstar Tom Cruise was nominated for an Oscar in what is generally considered a career best performance, as the steen stealing chauvinist who uses bravado and machismo to bury his crippling daddy issues. Magnolia is the kind of film that lives or dies off of its performances, and thankfully the collective efforts of Anderson's brilliant cast help the piece soar to exhilarating heights. Magnolia is not as visually stylized as Anderson's previous work, but he still manages to achieve a larger-than-life feel thanks to returning cinematographer Robert Ellsworth's virtuoso camera work. The film's aesthetic is textbook Anderson, a 235 to 1 anamorphic frame given vigor and color by a mix of confidently executed dolly, crane, steady cam, and handheld compositions. Like Boogie Nights before it, Magnolia uses long tracking shots to convey space and time, pulling its characters along their cosmic journeys. Ellswit and Anderson find the opportunity to experiment with different film stocks and cameras and Magnolia's bookending chance or fate sequences. A highlight being Anderson's use of an authentic, hand-cranked Pathé camera to simulate the look of old silent pictures. With Magnolia, Anderson's regular editor Dylan Tichenor has his work cut out for him in keeping track of all these disparate story threads. If Sergei Eisenstein's montage theory established how editing could be used to tie two separate events in time and space together, then Tichenor's work on Magnolia serves as the arguable evolution, interweaving the sweeping emotions of human experience into a cosmic tapestry. Anderson and Tichenor's edit plays like the film equivalent of a symphony, with harmonies and choruses organized into distinct movements. The movements themselves are distinguished via an inspired intertidal conceit that, instead of conveying the passage of time, notates changes in weather and humidity. It's an interesting idea that we'll certainly never see the likes of again, further evidencing Anderson's unique worldview. Magnolia is the first of Anderson's films not to feature the work of composer Michael Penn, but he does retain musical continuity in the form of Penn's wife, Amy Mann, and John Bryan. Bryan's score in particular is worth singling out, as he has created a brooding suite of orchestral cues that are once both foreboding and elegiac, 
giving the necessary weight to the burden that Anderson's characters must carry. The score ducks and wheezes throughout the piece, oftentimes playing against or running under diegetic source tracks from Man and Supertramp. The effect is disharmonious, but in a good way, further solidifying the film's mosaic conceits. Amy Mann is a huge vocal identity within the soundtrack, providing several key songs such as the show-stopping Wise Up. The song is incorporated in a strikingly original way, playing over a sequence in which the characters sing along to it, staged within their various individual vignettes. The result is nothing less than one of the most unexpected and memorable moments in recent film history. So just give up. The medium of video played a huge role in shaping Anderson's early worldview, like it did for several filmmakers of his generation. However, his treatment of the format undergoes something of an evolution throughout his filmography. In Boogie Nights, video was a disruptive, transgressive advancement that held malevolent implications for its characters. By the present-day narrative of Magnolia, video had become commonplace and commodified. Its power harnessed by people like Frank T.J. Mackey as a sales tool a slick, well-lit means to nefarious ends. Learn how to make that lady friend your sex star servant. Mackey's seduce and destroy operation is indicative of another of Anderson's thematic fascinations, that of sexual dysfunction. Mackey employs a tactical, scorched-earth approach to seduction, viewing women purely as targets to be eliminated with the ballistics rocket below his belt. As his character arc plays out, it becomes quite clear that this militaristic, aggressive, and highly disciplined approach to sex is a crutch he leans on. A shovel to bury deep-seated rage about his past and his family. Indeed, several of Magnolia's characters' dramatic troubles stem from sex in some manner. Riley and Walters' fumbling romance, Robards' abandonment of the love of his life for a fleeting affair, or Hall's continuing infidelity and the implied sexual abuse of his daughter. Magnolia's thematic exploration of sex dysfunction overlaps with his exploration of family dynamics, digging deep into his character's insecurities and faults to find an inherent desire for the comfort of home and family. Like he had done following the production of Boogie Nights, Anderson created a tie-in music video for his Magnolia musical muse, Amy Mann. The track, Save Me, appears during the closing scene of the feature, and was written specifically for the film. To reflect this, Anderson and Mann settled on an idea that would recreate key moments from Magnolia in motionless tableau form, while integrating Mann singing towards camera in the background. Anderson's fingerprints are all over this video, with a camera that continuously dollies forward on Mann with a creeping confidence. He also throws in a little visual variety by way of moving the furniture and set dressing around in elegant, almost impossible ways that reveal the hidden artifice of each vignette. Save Me is a simple yet moving little music video, and arguably Anderson's most popular. Like any wildly ambitious film, people didn't quite know what to make of Magnolia when it was released. The film didn't do well at the box office, but critics hailed it as a profound expansion of Anderson's directorial skill. People were just as quick to deem it a masterpiece as they were to deride it as an overindulgent failure. Regardless, Magnolia went on to considerable award season success, winning the prestigious Golden Bear Award at that year's Berlin Ale, as well as a second consecutive Academy Award nod for Anderson's screenplay. I, I, I just would want to say thank you to the jury. Um, thanks a lot for liking this movie, because uh, it helps, and it's very encouraging when you get prizes, when you really... It's just it's very encouraging to keep working hard. And... Um, um, thank you to my cast and to this amazing city, which is a great place to show a movie, and especially in this, this building. With the release of Magnolia, Anderson had arguably reached the peak of his capabilities within this particular set of stylistic conceits. He had gone from the boy wonder who took Sun Ants by storm, to the preeminent chronicler of California's weird and wonderful fringes, and all before his 30th birthday. However, he also had the intuition to realize that continuing along this route of valley-based ensemble epics would only lead to creative stagnation. A new direction was needed if Anderson was going to remain unpredictable, but just how sharp of a left turn that would ultimately be is something that absolutely no one could see coming. <laughs>